I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share uh, my passion for this field with you guys. It's important for us to develop a, an understanding, a, a common perspective. So I'm going to focus on historical landscape ecology and how that ties to stream restoration. So if you, if you think about it, before Europeans showed up in North America, beaver was a keystone species. They're, they're, they were like um, everywhere in North America with very few exceptions, a little bit in you know, the Southwest, but, but pretty much everywhere up to the Arctic Circle. And they had uh, dams and, and, and they had uh, like a density that was like one beaver family per uh, 150 acres. So a very high density. The beaver is this keystone species, which is really um, important to the, the drainage network in North America. And then um, with European colonization in North America, over a really short period of time, 40 to 60 years, um, the beaver were converted from this keystone species to a currency. And you can imagine if, if you can go out to your backyard and pick dollars off of a plant, that plant is going to be pretty short lived. And that's what happened to the beaver. They're largely extirpated from North America. Their, their dams failed, head cuts happened. You had single channels cutting up through um, all these uh, water storage facilities that the beaver had created. Um, you fast forward where the European population in North America was, was uh, becoming higher and more widespread. Um, water power became sort of a, a, a free and readily available source of energy. To that point, there was, there was really no concentrated fuels. It was wood or animal power or water power. Um, and, and so uh, man didn't have quite the density of beaver in terms of their, their mill dams, but they built these mill dams on pretty much every stream that they, they lived around. And, and that was important for, for water supply issues, for, for um, agricultural product preparation, like grinding grains, for lumber processing, furniture, clothing. So that was really the, you know, the industry that happened shortly after uh, European settlement became um, more broad spread. And um, then we had oil and coal extraction, which was a much better fuel than water, more, much more favorable fuel than water or wood. And so a lot of these mill dams were abandoned um, in favor of, of this, these other um, sources of energy. And then the Industrial Revolution really kicked off. About the same time that all this is going on, you've got this incredible loss of sediment um, from land clearing operations, conversion to agriculture, that, that sediment laden water is running down into the stream valley where it's getting trapped by these historic mill dams. Then with the Industrial Revolution, those mill dams became abandoned um, and they failed. And then you had head cutting through all that accumulated sediment, which reinforced this sort of single thread in size channel morphology that we've all grown up with. Um, at the same time that the Industrial Revolution was kicking on, we had a migration of workers from, from rural areas into the city for these better jobs. So we lost about 50% of our ag land to um, you know, forest. It basically they cleared the forest, and then in a modest amount of time, that forest regenerated into these abandoned ag lands. And fast forward a little bit more into the, like, say, the 19, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, uh, we had observational science in the form of um, engineers. Um, physicists who went out and looked at open channel flow and started developing an understanding of, of how this was happening with conclusions like erosion is a normal thing, streams, streams evolved to transport sediment because of the sediment load that they had. Um, and, and that has uh, further developed to this uh, reference system enigma, which, which I struggle with, which is 
um, all the streams that we see are streams that have been through this um, this challenge that I just laid out, this sort of abstract 300 years worth of um, modification by mankind and not in a in a thinking or a designed way just in a you know hit it up as we're as we're growing and learning so the result now is a lot of folks are going out looking at the best possible stream they can which is still the result of a lot of degradation and a lot of un, um, unnatural if you will systems and replicating those kind of features in our in our restored reaches and and i advocate a different approach this is a a project um, that Biohabitats was the designer on, um, a sister, not a sister firm, but a, a firm that we work with often, EQR, um, built it. And it was managed by a company called Greenvest, which is a, an environmental development firm. You could think of them as a mitigation banker, but in, in this instance, there was no compensatory mitigation. This was green infrastructure with the intent of improving water quality so that the Maryland State Highway Administration would pay for this improvement and and sort of put away water quality credits towards their permit requirements. So so it's a, it's a pretty um, interesting uh, ecological engineering approach. You're you're looking at one of our structures that is analogous to a beaver dam, and it's it's built out of wood. And I'll get into that in a little bit. This is a fairly large stream, um, 5,700 acre drainage area, 18,000 foot of stream work. Um, it drains to the South River in Annapolis area of Maryland, so the state capital. This is a slide just um, trying to give you a fast introduction to, to the technique for using the, the wood structures. We, um, we basically pull trees out of the ground in our project area, roots intact, cut them off six to eight, 10 foot above the the root and then invert them and push them into the stream to form a new stream invert a riffle grade control we'll call it and and that mixed with treetops and soil to sort of make this this carbon rich matrix that works to force the water to rise to the design elevation um, and then flow over and then we use the trunks of the trees to provide additional lateral and horizontal control. Um, any surplus material goes out into the floodplain. It supports other organisms. Um, it also increases uh, the resistance to flow, so the friction of the floodplain, which is desirable from a sustainability perspective. So a, a really pretty, pretty neat um, approach. And typically, depending on the size of the stream channel is being restored and the size of the floodplain and the footprint of the floodplain, we're looking at, we harvest 20 to 30% of the standing stock of trees. We start with undesirable trees, trees that are at risk, and then um, go where we need to go to, to develop enough building material. This is a, a slide of a, one of the tributaries, a large tributary. Um, you see me circled there walking up the stream. That's the pre-restoration condition. And then the same uh, stream reach in the post-restoration condition. And you can see that that water has come right up to the floodplain elevation and it's all controlled with wood and soil harvested from on site. This is a, another image, um, a more of a panoramic view, just to give you another feel for that. Uh, you see me circle there looking at the stream. The stream's, you know, five to eight foot in size, um, dewatering. The, the floodplain and and really not in good contact with the floodplain, even when it does have a storm flow. And then the lower panel is the post restoration condition, and you can see there's a lot of water up on in the stream channel on the floodplain. The soils are saturated. Um, definitely uh, successful um, from the water quality floodplain reconnection perspective. Uh, this is um, some groundwater monitoring data from another stream a smaller stream about 4,000 uh, foot of stream but on the same channel just further upstream so more of a head headwater reach the red line at the bottom of the graph is the invert of the incised channel prior to restoration and the green line 
um, two thirds of the way up the graph is the ground surface or the floodplain surface. So what you see in that um, peach colored, pink, whatever color that is, is when the pre-restoration condition, there was very little water in the stream. And then that the light blue line reflects the groundwater table 15 foot away from the stream. So it was, um, the stream was working as like an agricultural drain to lower the groundwater table in these floodplain wetlands. And then you see immediately upon restoration, both of those um, water table or the in stream goes right up to the top of bank, pretty close, and the groundwater elevation is within six inches of the surface, which is a, a desirable design um, elevation. And then above that, you see that the sort of purple line, that's the groundwater table 100 foot away from the stream, and that was at the edge of the, the floodplain at the stream valley wall. And you see pre-restoration, that water table was pretty high within a foot of the ground surface, which is that top blue line. And then post-restoration, you really don't see any change to that because the impacts of that incised channel didn't propagate all the way out to the edge of the floodplain. So you can actually look at how much of the floodplain you're rehydrating um, for hyperreic purposes or for wetland creation or wetland um, restoration purposes. Some benefits to this approach, um, if you if you're familiar with the natural channel design, that's based on this, this theory that you have a, a bankful channel flow which shapes the stream channel. So you're designing a channel to provide a flow that you only see once every year and a half or so. Whereas this approach, you're designing a channel that only conveys the base flow, the spring high base flow water in the channel. Every time you get a precipitation event or a storm flow, the water surface comes up and goes out into this connected floodplain where nature has a lot more surface area in contact with it and all kind of good things happen. You can imagine, you know, reduced um, velocity of flow, increased surface area of biological treatment, you know, lots of, lots of really positive things for water quality, for habitat, for vernal pools. Um, Based on, on a lot of work in the literature and going through the regulatory review process, I think we were able to demonstrate that the, the, um, the approach is sustainable when you have a forested watershed because the, the trees accumulate material faster than they decompose, um, especially in a wet condition. And, and remarkably, because you're not importing a lot of rock, you're not driving a lot of trucks all over the place, and you're also not having to build a really big haul road for, for instance, for an 18,000 foot long um, stream restoration project. The cost is much lower than standard stream restoration or typical stream restoration, um, 10 to 25 percent of the, the cost. Other benefits, you know, pertaining to the ecological uplift, so that so that this kind of a restoration approach goes under a nationwide permit from the Corps of Engineers because there's so much ecological uplift. It's not just the water quality benefits, but that first panel is showing um, yellow perch spawn that occurred. And, and prior to this, this uh, restoration project, the water was about an inch to two inches deep in the stream under these conditions. And now we have, you know, five, six foot of water in the pools. So this is very attractive. We've had yellow perch coming up um, into the restored reach and spawning. Um, Obviously, the reconnection to the floodplain reduces the amount of in-stream erosion, reduces the, the shears, um, and, and constructing the project has a much lower carbon footprint than uh, you know, a project that involves mining and a lot of equipment transport of rock to the site. And this is the last slide, and this is a, this is a photograph of our construction access point last week. So this project was just finished in the beginning of April, and this is a photograph from, you know, the second week, the end of the second week in April. And um, you see, we ha it's not like we've gone in and cut down all the trees or had some, some big nasty uh, construction impact. It's, it's a, a pretty um, low impact restoration approach. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.
the first one is how do you decide where the most effective place to put the engineered bridge structure is? What's that decision process look like? Um, it's it's a it's a it's a good question. It's it's probably not something that I'm going to give you a lot of uh, comfort with. You know, you've you've got this project reach. In some cases, um, you know, eighteen thousand foot. You look at the at the stream from a plan form and from a profile perspective. Um, you do a detailed topographic survey so you understand depressional features along the stream. Um, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to basically flood out a whole big section of floodplain by putting a, a, a riffle grade control structure in a spot where it's um, low, you know, where the, the floodplain is low. So it's, it's a, a standard engineering approach where you're, you're looking at the profile and designing with, with your stream gradient, your floodplain gradient, and um, your topo. I can't say too much more about that. You know. Okay, a couple other ones here. Um, one ties it back to the beaver in, in asking, have you ever seen beaver move into these sites after a few years or a period of time? Absolutely, in fact, on, on this particular project, um, after we built the first upstream rifle grade control, which backwatered um, the area upstream of our our project site, we had beaver on our project site. And, and I've seen beaver out there um, pretty much every time I've visited the site. And I, I like to visit the site pretty often. There's lots of sign of beaver, uh, unfortunately, chewing up some of our live stakes. But I mean, it is, it is what it is. They are, they'll move in and they'll, they'll capitalize and hopefully uh, the changes that they make to our riffle gray control structures will be more in the form of reinforcement rather than abandon, abandonment, you know, like, oh, what are these guys doing? These Europeans are just making trouble for us. Let's, um, we're hoping that they're actually going to be reinforcing these structures over time, although they haven't been designed with that as a requirement. Okay. Yeah, there was a question about making them beaver ready. So um, let's see. There's also a couple questions about the app applicability to more urbanized watersheds. Um, and you said that this is sustainable in forested watersheds. How forested? Right. And can it be fairly urban watershed that has a good forested riparian area? Yeah, so, so most of my experience is in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and, and when you go into cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., um, their stream stream valley parks are appropriate um, areas for this. You know, lots of lots of trees, typically a, a fairly incised and degraded channel. So so it can work in those locations. Where where it wouldn't make a lot of sense is where you you don't have um, you know a, an active forest community um, because it, you know the the wood might might break down if it's exposed to a lot of uh, fluctuating water levels. In a, some of it might break down in a decade. The material that's subsurface will last um, millennia. I mean, we've we've had a, a project when they were building Raven Stadium where they were digging up um, uh, cypress trees that still had the leaves on them. You know, the, the little needle leaves. So once it's in that saturated tannic um, area that it doesn't decompose. But if you don't have a good um, limb fall um, and leaf fall every year, you're probably uh, better with a different type of restoration approach. Okay. There's some questions also about um, the, the feedback about the long-term stability of these structures. And is there any research yet that shows um, long-term data on on how these systems hold up. It's a it's a tough question to, because we really haven't been um, the, our, the restoration community really hasn't been building structures with wood for very long, and some of the early structures that were built with wood by folks like Trout Unlimited um, or Ducks Unlimited, uh, they weren't 
well designed. They were um, more like a level spreader, and they they caused bank erosion and abandonment. Um, so most of the the literature that supports this approach is is more um, from aging materials that have been excavated in floodplains. So they'll you know they'll find trees that are are buried in the stream bank that are trapping other trees so this is a, a dam and um, they're looking at some of those trees as, as being thousands of years in place um, of course you know most streams were harvested the the, the corps of engineers and and other uh, local organizations had a policy of snagging and removing trees for navigation and and other um, uses. So we're, we're really working in an area where we have a, a long uh, historic record, but not much in the way of the actual engineered wood structures that we're, we're building today. Okay. Um, what would success look like? What would uh, the, what would the, the metrics be to show success for a project like this? Um, dramatically attenuated um, flood peaks um, in and downstream of the project. That's that's something that we've seen. Um, the restored groundwater, um, increased uh, aquatic life criteria, IBIs, and what have you. Um, increased wetland distribution, um, better water quality. I mean, there. They're the metrics that we're focused on at this point. Let's see, there are a lot of really good questions. <laughs> there are a lot I only of really want the easy questions. ones. <laughs> I'm looking for a hard one, Joe. Uh, let's see. So, um, so somebody was asking about would this work in situations where they're limited to no increases in a 100-year water surface elevation. Um, yes, and it, it can. It's it's a site-specific kind of um, question, but but I can I can tell you how it how it could work because we we've, we've been able. I mean, we we have to um, meet that standard when we do projects. So the way that it can work is rather than building stage in this stream channel, which causes a lot of backwaters at these um, tortuous meanders or at, at obstructions, we're, we're putting the water, as soon as that stage increase is coming down the channel, it's going out into the floodplain. And the floodplain on this project is, is um, several hundreds of feet wide. It varies from, from perhaps as little as 200 foot to five, 600 foot wide. Um, so, so there's really not an appreciable increase in the historically mapped or even in the modeled 100-year floodplain um, pre and post restoration because we have this large um, flood-prone area. So yeah, it can definitely be done that way. In fact, it's pretty much um, the only way they get permitted. All right, I'm going to go back to the beavers here. So. Um in situations where there's already a beaver, a beaver present, um, but it hasn't built a dam yet, how would you work with the beaver? Um, <clears throat> we had a we had another project that we did um, where we used about a dozen beaver dam analogs, which were um, hand in place structures. It, we we put 12 of these structures in about a thousand foot of in size stream, about five foot deep, and um, five or six foot wide, and the, the beaver weren't able to persist in that environment because of the the flashy urban hydrology. Um, they 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 were there. They had a they had some pretty poor condition um, bank um, residences, but they really couldn't build across the stream. So what they would do is they'd be out in the floodplain building these depressional features and and digging mud out, and it wasn't it wasn't very good habitat. We put in a, a dozen of these structures, two of them the beaver actually built onto and backwatered this, um, you know, very nice, uh, it was 
they probably backwatered about 600 foot of this thousand foot um, reach that we did with those um, beaver dam analogs, which were just willow, like three to four inch willow lies. Woven again by labor, no equipment um, needed to be brought out, all carried out by laborers and installed by laborers. Unfortunately, beaver management in, in a lot of our urban areas um, is is a mixed bag. Um, so you, you can you can see if if uh, somebody gets wind of a beaver and and they happen to be of that mindset that this is a bad thing, they can legally go in and trap them out. And we've seen that as well on sites.